We're going to start the next session in about two minutes, so just two minute heads up. No, you're fine. Okay, we're going to start the next section, but before I do that, I, I realized that we were, uh, um, when we were thanking people for support, that I actually forgot that to thank the NIDDK because they uh, helped fund uh, the, some of the travel and speakers for with through an R13 mechanism. So thank you, Jose, and your group. Greatly appreciated. So. <laughs> So it's it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for the Ruth Bruski Award for Excellence in Research on Pancreatic Cancer. This is often a highlight for those of us uh, in the pancreatic cancer uh, world to, to have uh, this opportunity. Uh, this year's awardee is, is Dr. Sudhir Sarvastava. But before we do that, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the person who was this award was from. So uh, this is Ruth and Alan Brofsky. The Ruth uh, unfortunately died of pancreatic cancer at, at, a, at a relatively young age. And this is just a few highlights of Ruth Brofsky's amazing life. She was born in New York City in 1939. She married her childhood sweetheart, Alan. They met at around the age of 13. She uh, was actually initially her career was a school teacher in underprivileged neighborhoods in New York City and Washington, D.C. During this time, she raised three amazing children, including Adam Brofsky, who's uh, a, a world renowned breast oncologist at, at, at UPMC. And uh, she's had eight grandchildren. She actually went back to school later in life and at the age of 40, graduated from law school and became an education lawyer in Connecticut for 14 years before she tragically passed away from pancreatic cancer. And so her family got together in, in, in her legacy, they, and they wanted to support both pancreatic cancer research, and then they've endowed a yearly lecture for Pancreas Fest. Here's a list of some of our previous recipients, many of whom are, are still are, are in the audience. And then now, this year, we get the opportunity to uh, add one more to the list for 2023. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Sudhir Sarvastava as our 2023 Ruth Bruski Awardee for Excellence in Pancreatic Cancer Research. Dr. Sarvastava received his PhD in biochemistry at the Banaras Hindu University in India. He came to the U.S. in the 1980s, and following his completion in 1990 in a preventive oncology training at the NCI, he began his journey in cancer prevention at the NCI. He's been chief of the Cancer Biomarkers Research Group since 2000. 
His efforts focus on molecular biology and malignancies, early malignancies, risk ass assessment and informatics. He's provided leadership in the areas of molecular screening and early detection. He's one of the principal authors of the Bethesda Guidelines for Diagnosing Hereditary Non-Polyposis Colorectal Cancer. He's received several national and international honors and awards and is a member of scientific committees. In 1995, he was elected to the American Joint Committee on Cancer, which is responsible for staging criteria for cancers for worldwide use. And he serves on the executive committee. He was the first Asian American and non-MD to do so. Under his leadership, the AGCC has accepted the inclusion of tumor markers and staging guidelines for colorectal cancer. Uh, he's received several NIH and NCI honors and awards, has initiated and chaired state of the science, national and international level workshops and conferences, and was the principal architects of the first Gordon Research Conference on New Frontiers in Cancer Detection and Diagnosis. He's also initiated new areas of research, uh, molecular signatures of infectious agents in cancer, microimaging and classifying preneoplastic lesions, nanotechnology and early cancer detection, metabolomics and glycomics alliances with the uh, other NIH institutes. He has more than 70, 170 peer-reviewed papers. He's edited four books. He's editor-in-chief of the journal Disease Biomarkers. He's led creation of the journal Cancer Biomarkers and is appointed uh, the editorial board of uh, Journal of Cancer Prevention Research. He's a member of several different scientific committees. He's a founding member of HUPO, principal architect of the NCI's Early Detection Research Network and the founding editor and board member for the Journal of Proteomic and Bioinformatics. Uh, beyond these accomplishments, he's a strong advocate for pancreatic cancer at the NCI. Under his leadership, he's helped develop and support several major consortiums, including the PCDC, CPDPC, and EDRN consortiums. I'm honored that he was able to come to Pancreas Fest this year and receive the Ruth Brusky Award and provide us with his personal reflections on pancreatic cancer, early detection, past, present, and future. So looking forward to your talks in here. Randy. Thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. And as you heard from him that I had been at NCI almost about three decades. And the only focus I had was early detection. And in 1990, no one even cared about early detection, but I'm so happy to see that the community has picked up this, uh, the theme of early detections from academia to government to private sectors and also foundations. So this is very gratifying for me to see that this is happening during my lifetime. I'm really humbled and honored to receive this prestigious award. And also I just cannot imagine being here in the league of some outstanding investigators who were the previous awardees of this, this prestigious um, uh, 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 um, Brufuski Award, and I'm so happy to be a non, again, non-MD to receive this award. If you look at the list of all those names, most of them are my professional friends, and I know all of them, but being a non-MD, it's a great honor to be here. My theme is that it takes a village. So what does it mean? Over my professional life, I have nurtured collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And I've created a number of programs focusing on pancreatic cancers as well as some other cancer types as well. Last two days of this meeting has been very gratifying to see so much progress being made in pancreatic cancer. So I just leave, uh, I read one line from uh, the Ruth Profiski Award uh, introduction about Ruth. Had she lived, she would have seeing the success of the seeds she planted and nurtured, which is very true. Ruth may not be here in person, but Ruth is here in spirit. And she will be very proud to see the way things are happening in pancreatic cancer. And I have no doubt that at least minimally, 
we would be able to increase the pancreatic cancer survivorship and also improve early detection over our lifetime. It takes a village. So many foundations, including CAPERS and, uh, and also many of the prior sectors who are here to support this conference. And of course, the investigator and both new and young who are in this audience are really dedicated to bring this reality, you know, bring this, uh, their research into reality in terms of early detection of pancreatic cancer. What I'm going to speak about is my professional journey when I started uh, my, my deep interest in pancreatic cancer because of some family reasons as well. And also because of my own reason, because being in, trained in public health, this is one of the cancer types where the case fatality is almost 100%. And that's really motivated me uh, to do something about it. Next slide, please. Oh, I can do this. So it was 1999 uh, when I was invited. In fact, we supported this meeting uh, uh, to um, a famous lodge in Park City, Utah. Definition of pre-cancer had been a challenging task in oncology. Many of the cancer types, we don't have the true definition of pre-cancer. This meeting was organized by Scott Kern and Ralph Ruban and Randy was there as well. I wish I could get the original picture where I could show him at that time, but I couldn't find one. Uh, and basically the goal was to define what you call pan in one, two, and three at that meeting. That was the genesis, really truly a genesis of definition of pre-cancer for uh, pancreatic cancer. At that time, uh, um, many pathologists, at least I know seven sets of slides were given to many pathologists attending that meeting. And they came up with a different interpretation for their readings. Someone say it's a hyperprolific, uh, uh, proliferative, someone says metaplasia, someone says it. And WHO had no definition for precancer in case of pancreatic cancer. So this was a, it's a kind of landmark meeting to define pan in, pan one, uh, pan in and pan two and pan three. Next please. So that led to, that really led to a white paper. And uh, as, I, uh, as you can see here that many of those big names, including one sitting in the audience here, uh, Randy, uh, a white paper uh, that was the product of this pancreas uh, cancer think tank meeting. And uh, I'm so fortunate that I was among only four attendees from NCI to attend this meeting. So this is the best I could do, uh, find a picture of all, some of those attendees. And as you can see here, that I will really say pioneer in the field of pancreatic cancer, they are sitting in the audience. And Andy, I'm sorry I couldn't find it, but uh, that you, your picture was there, but they had, there's no record of a, some sort of historical event uh, for this pancreatic cancer. It should be, but there's none. But it's, many of you can recognize uh, Michael Goggins there, Ralph Ruban there, and many more. And Bert Vogelstein is there, all those uh, attendees in terms of defining, uh, uh, developing the course of pancreatic cancer research. So then in 2021, and I was, um, um, I, I was um, invited to this meeting uh, that the state of pancreatic cancer research in terms of early detection, treatment, risk assessment, and so on. So this is a, a paper that came out in, in pancreatic pathology, as you can see here, that's a semi-centennial of pancreatic pathology. The generation revolution is here, but don't throw the baby out of the bath. Uh, um, with the bath water. Idea here is that even though we have expanded knowledge of molecular biology, the pathology remains the workhorse of pancreatic cancer research. And that's where we look into for staging and grading of pancreatic cancer. Some of you may not have seen it, but this is a very uh, uh, good uh, paper to read about if you're interested in learning more about the state of the art in pancreatic cancer. 
So as I said earlier that uh, at that time, the five-year survival used to be less than 3% for pancreatic cancer, even though we have done much better now in terms of five-year survival. But you have to remember, if there are uh, statisticians and epidemiologists sitting in the audience, uh, survival is not the true indicator of benefit of uh, either treatment or screening or early detection, but they are still being used. Uh, in literature about that. And especially for pancreatic cancer, even a, a month life save is, is very important. And therefore the survival, uh, five-year survival makes, is, makes sense for us to, uh, to use them in terms of our progress being made in pancreatic cancer. So that as you know, that pancreatic cancer is projected to become the second leading cause of cancer related death in the United States by 2030. It is estimated that about 60,000 new cases and 48,000 deaths from this disease in 2021, that is already passed. Only 10 to 20% patients present a receptable tumor at the time of diagnosis. And among those uh, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, only 10.8%, which is about 11%, is expected to survive five years or more. And that is based on the SEER data. So, the case for early detection is the following. If you look into the so-called uh, um, uh, survival curve here, that the, the pan in uh, our stage 1A is all in, almost about 25 months of survival as compared to if you go to stage four, uh, is about, uh, about three months. And as you know, that most of the pancreatic cancer detected is in stage three or four. And that's what we need to change and what I call a stage shift. We need to develop technology when we can be, uh, bring more uh, pancreatic cancer to the earliest stage. And why is that? If you look into, uh, into this, this slide, that if you increase the proportion of early stage disease, you also improve the five-year survival. If you look into the stage 1A, the, the current uh, proportion is about 1.3, but if you increase by six times or five times, you double the survival. Or if you do 12 times, uh, then you triple the survival. And, or if you do uh, uh, 30, 25 times, then you, it's about quadruple, uh, quadrupling of the survival. So there is a benefit in terms of doing uh, the detection of all the stage disease. Now, the question is always there that what should we do in terms of such a deadly cancer, surveillance or screening? Well, we don't have any screening for pancreatic cancer, but can we do surveillance for some of those cancer types, for example, pancreatic cyst? So the next slide is here, uh, is that types of people who could be screened are the following, like germline, people with germline mutation, people with family history of pancreatic cancer, or people with uh, diabetes, as you know very well, not new onset of diabetes where it's expected that about 0.7% uh, will develop pancreatic cancer within three years time period. So that's that's fairly a uh, big number. Other high risk populations could include individuals with pancreatic cancer precursor lesions, for example, pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia, panin, as I talked to you earlier, intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasia, and also mucinous cystic neoplasm. So the benefit of surveillance. So this is from the CAP study that Michael Goggins and John Sopkin has been doing for many years. And as you, as you can see here, that, that the, those who are in, under surveillance, and I call it screen detected, their five-year survival is much better than those which are not, which is at the really last one, that's the red one. Uh, as you can see here that, uh, um, uh, that um, if you have a pancreatic cancer, which is under surveillance and screen detected, the five-year survival is much better than those which are outside this surveillance. And mostly they are very late stage or high-grade dysplasia uh, in, in this case. So we, we heard a lot about imaging methods for early detection. So the early stage PDAC and panions are not detectable by routine cross-sectional imaging especially transabdominal ultrasound or CT or MRI. IPMNs and MCN, as I said earlier, difficult to distinguish benign from precancerous lesions. 
and also increasingly uh, identified by abdominal imaging for non-specific symptoms. If you are looking for screening and early detection, we also have to think about being non-invasive, but endoscopic ultrasound guided final aspirates is not considered non-invasive, but it remains a gold standard, highly specific, but poor sensitivity for early stage disease. Imaging techniques have pushed the detection limit to lesion between three and 10 millimeter size, but offer no significant improvement in survival. Now, combining diagnostic imaging with lab-based biomarkers is, continues to be our hope that could improve detection and improve survival. So based on this knowledge over the years at NCI, I have been really uh, building uh, establishing programs and I've listed them here. So my first intro introduction to pancreatic cancer was 1992 when I initiated a program called Cancer Control Small Ground Program uh, focused on NCI and that time, uh, focused on uh, pancreatic cancer. And that time we focused on both exocrine and endocrine uh, pancreatic cancer. In 2000, we, we really developed a, a, a bigger program called EDRN, Early Detection Research Network. And then 2005, uh, we started to look into more technology and therefore to support the technology development, we established a pilot study in pancreatic cancer through R21 program. You heard from Randy that we are 2020, uh, 2014, uh, we had CPDPC and 2014, we also have MCL. Now I, I want to explain to you what MCL is. So even though it may not be applicable to pancreatic cancer, the screen detected lesions are likely to be uh, non-lethal. And therefore, in order to prevent overdiagnosis, we need to have the biological mechanism to distinguish between lethal versus non-lethal. So the MCL at that time was focused on distinguishing uh, early stage disease into lethal into non-lethal. And then we had uh, a cancer imaging and biomarker program. And you heard uh, over the two, last two days about you know, combining imaging and biomarker to improve diagnostic performance uh, for early detection of pancreatic cancer. So if you see all those consortium we have built, we felt, well, why not just bring them all together in one umbrella? So that's where it is, it takes a village. Uh, so we had APAC. APAC is basically Alliance of Pancreatic Cons Cons Consortium that meets every year. And that includes members from all of those funded grantees and also uh, uh, invited guests uh, to discuss the state of the science in pancreatic cancer and develop collaborative studies funded through EDRN and many other programs. The new program that really uh, was developed is called TBEL. Uh, TBEL is really the, the successor of MCL. The goals remain, but here the emphasis is more on studying the biology of pancreatic cancer, especially the early stage disease. So I always use this slide. It's a kind of hub and spokes model. So I've listed all the programs. So the hub in our case is EDRN because EDRN has the mechanism to support a validation study, which is not usually found very glamorous in terms of uh, funding uh, our uh, by peer review process. EDRN has, has uh, basically filled the void in terms, if you have a good biomarkers in pancreatic cancer, please talk to us. We'll help you validate them through our EDRN mechanism. We have a number of international uh, um, collaboration, especially for US EDRN in Japan, uh, US EDRN in China. Over the years, we have also developed, and that's what I call leveraging the resources of other federal agencies, is Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, NIST or NIST, and also Pacific Northwest uh, National Lab, which are, champ which are really a, uh, a great resource for proteomic studies and also for Center for Prostate Disease Research, which is part of the DOD. Now, while we were doing this, then came out about Recalcitrant Cancer Research Act, which is a, in 20, 2014, uh, recommended uh, that we need to establish, especially for pancreatic cancer, 
uh, to develop new molecular and imaging biomarker for patients at high risk of PDAC because of genetic factors or pre presence of mucinous pancreatic cyst, uh, and that are likely to be candidates for early surgical intervention. So this really led to the development of what we call Pancreatic Cancer Detection Consortium, PCDC, that you heard from Randy. And the PCDC really addresses the ever uh, mentioned recommendation. So PCDC started in 2016 with three research units and developed a full consortium over the next two years. And now, at, as of now, as I speak, there are about eight research units within PCDC. Next. Now, this is the website. As you see here, the FOA is still active. On the very uh, right-hand bottom corner, you can see that if anyone who may be interested in applying for it, they can still apply. So the PCDC is focused on developing and testing new molecular and imaging biomarkers for detecting oral stage PDAC and precursor lesions. These biomarkers would be useful for identifying individuals who are at high risk of developing PDAC and are con candidates for oral intervention. So now I'm going to tell you the story about uh, why biomarkers are failing and as you know that we hear, uh, we heard many talks and biomarkers during this meeting as well. The reason being is that the, from the very discovery, they are not stringent or rigorous enough to be evaluated for subsequent step, which is validation. So most of the discovery, in fact, I would say 90% of discovery reported in journals are actually in phase one. So they, they found and promising uh, a candidate that might distinguish between case control study. However, those case control samples were convenient sample. They were not really well annotated, uh, clinically annotated sample that could be used for discovering biomarker. That has been, had been one of the, and continues to be one of the biggest challenge in the field of pancreatic cancer biomarker discovery. Then comes, so when you have a phase one, 90% of reported biomarkers on phase one, how, the, how to bring them to phase two, which becomes a challenge for us. So the EDR and develop what we call uh, uh, probe, uh, study design, as you see here, that if they muster through or passes through the study design, they go to phase two and phase three and phase four. But, EDRN also brought a novel study uh, uh, approach, which is called Bake Off study. So many of you may have number of biomarkers, but the, you may, may not have means to rapidly evaluate them in, in a way that, that could tell you whether it is likely to succeed or not likely to succeed in detection of early stage disease. So EDRN started this program called Standard Bias and Specimen Reference Sets. And as I've shown here, that we have these sample sets available for distribution to any extramural scientist, and they are housed in NCI Frederick. So what is the reference sets? Basically, reference sets are uh, a case control samples which are really suited for intended goals. In our case, is detection of early stage disease. Reference sets also provide a triaging system that allows a go or no go. If so if you are trying to look into biomarkers that are mature enough to go to phase two or phase three, this is a step that you can use to go or no go decision-making process. And especially in EDRN, if successful, a large value set study is planned. That means phase three and beyond. To my knowledge, this was the first concept originated and implemented with EDRN for rapid evaluation of technology and biomarkers for not just the pancreatic cancer, for a variety of cancer types. So based on these guidelines, uh, I'm going to give you some examples. So this approach was taken uh, for uh, rapid evaluation of biomarkers under the auspices of the Alliance of Pancreatic Cancer Consortia for biomarkers for early detection. As, as you can see here, the participants who are listed here, various organizations like PCDC, CPDPC, MCL, EDRN, and, and foundations as well. Actually, 
the idea was developed through Kenner uh, uh, Foundation and also PANCAN to have these biomarkers tested, tested in a collaborative uh, mode. So, okay, so this is what we did at, uh, um, at, at this Bake Off study. So specimens are collected by EDR and CVC and Randy was very instrumental in that at UPMC and MD Anderson. Those samples were divided by EDR and DMCC independent of uh, people who are collecting those samples into two sets. One was Bake Off sets and other was Bake Off one and other was Bake Off two. The specimens were then blinded to the biomarker discovery lab at UPMC, MD Anderson, Van Andel, UNMC, and, F and Fred, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. And then once they were analyzed for their own biomarkers, the data were sent to DMCC. So Bake Off One really served as a training. So candidate panels developed by DMCC and Bake Off Two, validation of candidates, candidate panels by DMCC as well. And performance were evaluated relative to a clinical CA-99 assay, as you know, this continues to be a gold standard uh, for pancreatic cancer. So here are the, some of the data that we received. So there are two panels of biomarkers. Some of the biomarkers, they showed very high specificity and some of the biomarkers, they showed very high sensitivity. So the CA-99 level uh, threshold was adjusted accordingly. So for top panel, uh, the CA99 uh, was in 160 units. Um, and while on the bottom panel is about just about uh, two uh, units. And if you look into this, um, uh, the performance, especially in terms of sensitivity and specificity, there are two biomarkers that really stand out. And fortunately, unfortunately, they are compatible to CA99. This is again shows our inability, not the failure, inability to bring biomarkers that are better than a CA99. So if you look at the sensitivity for a CA99 and uh, then what you call STRA, it's about 71.71 and 0.61, while the specificity is almost the same. So at least we can say that we found a biomarker that could really match the CA99 uh, performance. On the bottom panel, if you look into this, again, the two biomarkers that stand out in terms of sensitivity are clinical CA199 and also uh, um, uh, CA99 um, and STRA, which is developed by Brian Hopp. And also if, uh, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, uh, they're all very compatible. So, what did we learn from this? Many of the biomarkers claimed to be highly sensitive and specific. They did not do very well. At least we narrowed down some of the biomarkers to two biomarkers that could be further evaluated in combination with the biomarker that I've shown here under the panel called additional biomarkers. It may not be a, a big uh, um, victory or uh, winner or losers, but at least we had been able to triage those biomarkers that are likely to be helpful in early stage disease detection. Then comes pancreatic cyst biomarkers alliance. Again, we tested many biomarkers here, which I'll show you uh, in the next slide. And the goal here again was that, can we find out biomarkers that can distinguish the pancreatic cyst, which are likely to become lethal and from those which are not likely to be le lethal. So in the next slide I've shown here that we, selected number of biomarkers from variety of sources. And author is in, in audience. He led this study, I don't, I don't see him. Uh, he led this study from UPMC. So it's a pancreatic sick, uh, DNA methylation, telomerase, uh, proteases, uh, a, 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 a reg and glucose and mucin. So these are biomarkers that are tested for pancreatic cancer uh, cyst. So the next slide, I show here that if you look into the mucin of the non mucinous cyst, again, as I said, I, we wanted to uh, figure it out which are lethal, which are not lethal. And you, you look, you compare the sensitivity versus specificity. So um, uh, sensitivity varied from somewhere between 72 to 75, while specificity is 90, you know, 70, 47, 78, and 100%. 100% is still need to be verified at this point in time. 
In terms of advanced neoplasia, again, the lethal versus non-lethal or not, if you look in the sensitivity that varied from 32 to 44, and specifically varied from 81 to 92. What do we get out of this? At least we were able to figure it out which of those stated biomarkers that we found are reported could be useful for further evaluation through EDRN. And that's exactly what we are doing now. Now, there are new generations of biomarkers, I call, coming up. And one of them, you just heard one of the talks about uh, cell-free microRNA versus exosomal microRNA. And here is the, uh, the work from Dr. Goyal uh, from City of Hopes. And so he compared both cell-free mRNA and exosomal RNA, microRNA. I want to tell you that exosomal RNA are anything that based on exosomal likely to be more tissue specific because as you know that uh, that exosome uh, might be originating uh, with some what we call signatures of the tissue of origin. So he compared these two biomarkers as you can see here uh, that um, um, that almost about not exactly the same performance level but they seem to be complementary because in some of the areas where uh, cell-free microRNAs they failed in other areas, exosomal microRNA detected. So what he did is the next slide is that he, he did this with the auto seeker in, in training versus um, uh, validation cohort, as you can see here, that if you combine those two, then your auto seek curve is much, much better than just by themselves alone. For example, combination on the right panel, you can see the AUC is about 93%, uh, and while uh, if you look into exo and microRNA versus circulating free microRNA, they're still lower than uh, uh, combining them. Again, that tells us that biomarkers are either, someone asked the question this morning, whether you CTDNA or, or you look into um, exosomal DNA, I believe that they're complementary and they can complement if you look into uh, their combination for detecting uh, pancreatic cancer. This has not been an easy task. So we have been working with Japanese as well because they, they can do a lot more things much easier than us. For example, they established high-risk cohorts in Japan for pancreatic cancer. They tested there and so, but they wanted to test our reference sample for the validity of their biomarkers. So uh, we had been hosting meetings uh, in Tokyo. This, these are all prior to COVID. We haven't had any meeting after COVID, but before COVID, we really had a, uh, many uh, programs working with Japanese uh, scientists. And the very first thing that we, we, they reported and we found, uh, we, we collaborated, was that the plasma biomarker for detection of early stage pancreatic cancer is a risk factor for pancreatic malignancy using antibodies for apolipoprotein A2 isoform. We were very skeptical in the beginning. Even the EDI members were very skeptical in it. But when they tested this, uh, so let me give you some background about this biomarker. So apolipoprotein, uh, you can say it's out of serendipity. So they were looking into the uh, serum of uh, a pancreatic cancer patient. At first they used the good old cell D, which you no longer use, uh, to see what is the, the pattern, uh, uh, peptide pattern of those uh, uh, biomarkers. They found that one of the the particular uh, uh, peptide were decreasing in, in the level. So in order to confirm, they used MALDI, MALDI TAR. And MALDI TAR was able to also verify and duplicate the finding that was reported on CELDI platform, that there's a protein with APOA2 fragment. Uh, and as I can see here, that, that, is, that's, that was really identified as 17, uh, 252 milli, uh, um, her uh, peak, and that really tells them at least that told them that this is a potential candidate for detecting. But here's the catch: instead of going up, this was going down. And again, skepticism. Most of the biomarkers you look for going up, not down. But they were very persistent, and they started looking into it. And they reported that if you combine this candidate biomarker that gives you the, the performance characteristics of about 0.925. 
this is the time they came to EDRN and say, can you or can we validate our biomarkers in EDRN reference sample? And we were very happy to collaborate with them, provide them samples, and look what, their findings on EDRN reference samples were almost identical to what they found with their samples. Now, that's a very a good story of international partnership where they could use EDR sample to verify their findings. Now, that led them to file um, uh, what we call Japanese FDA. And now Japanese FDA has approved APOA2 as a biomarker for, uh, or, uh, for detection of uh, pancreatic cancer. Now they're working here in the United States, they opened a, a, a some sort of CLIA lab in the United States to work further with ED Allen to uh, develop their test so that they can also uh, file uh, a similar um, kind of um, application to FDA for approval. So again, this is really uh, a, a kind of, uh, it takes a village collaboration across international boundary. And as you can see here, now, what are the future directions uh, for pancreatic cancer? So I cannot speak for clinical aspect, but I can tell you about in terms of translation research that there are a lot of things we need to do. One of the things is that we, can, we should continue to work with nonprofit organizations like PanCan, Lust Garden, Kenner Family Research Fund. Artificial intelligence, radiomics, physical sciences approach, nanoplasmonic uh, way of discovering biomarkers. There was a presentation this morning about discovering biomarkers as well, using nano uh, 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 approach. Pancreatic precancer atlas. This is something I really uh, champion because at least there's, a, um, there, there's an opportunity for collecting longitudinal samples in a cis setting. Uh, where there is a surveillance program and they can really use those samples to develop pancreatic cancer uh, atlas. Of course, international partnership. So in doing so, we have really published a number of, uh, I would say conceptual articles, and that could really help you when you apply for or read uh, for any grant support from NIH uh, to think about how we are thinking. So precancer atlas, <clears throat> this is just a paper came out. I wrote a commentary on precancer atlas present and future. And this was captured on the, uh, the cover page of the journal, July 1st, 2023. Pan cancer early detection disorder. As I said earlier that uh, we collaborated with pan -can, uh, uh, pan can to determine if the pancreas protocol CT imaging at the time of new onset of diabetes results in an earlier detection of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So this is an interventional trial. And this came out from um, uh, CPDPC, which is a, which is a insular study of the new onset of cohort study. And, uh, and obviously the pan cancer is sponsor. And uh, uh, it links with the NIH NART cohort studying, the con uh, studying by contributing samples to the NCI uh, in, uh, NART. And also, um, um, uh, adding and uh, en enriching new onset diabetes for pancreatic cancer score and images to determine if they approach us in early detection. The trial is ongoing, but I just want to share the study design. And here, is, here it is. So how to prove there's a nexus between type two diabetes and pancreatic cancer. So I remember a story, uh, Margaret Tempero who had been discussing about this NOD or uh, diabetes and pancreas for years. I remember hosting her in one of the NCI sponsored meeting in early uh, 2000, I think 2003 or 2004. People then were very skeptical about this. And now people strongly because there are evidence to show that there is a nexus between pancreatic cancer and, and, and not. So here's the schema that, that um, PanCan is using. So for example, Having a new onset diabetes plus weight, uh, it's about 13,000 subjects being accrued. There'll be two arms. One will be interventional arm, another will be observational arm. And then we are using the end pack, which is developed by Suresh Chari, that further enrich the interventional arm into end pack, is called greater than zero, and, and 
Well, Beecham, who oh, is sitting in the audience, he is really the part of this, the study design. Is he here? Uh, Beecham? Okay, left. So um, bottom line is that it will help us identify whether or not having our intervening by imaging could help us detect pancreatic cancer early enough so they are curable. As I said earlier, the study is on, ongoing and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll learn about this in a few years. So Alliance of Pancreatic Cancer Consortium Imaging Project, again, we are embarking on building two retrospective cohort and controls. And here the PDAC patients for whom pre-cancer imaging and clinical data are available. PDAC patient for whom diagnostic scans for stage one, two tumors are available, and also different types of controls from people who did not develop cancer. Then there'll be a competition analysis uh, uh, based on body compartment and primary lesions. And then long-term goal is to build predictive models uh, to improve uh, accuracy of imaging scans for early and more accurate detection of PDAC. In essence, what is saying that pre-cancer may predate or predicate the impending cancer if we have data coming from either electronic health record or other places. So we are, uh, and the idea is this, as I said, is the pre-diagnostic image, uh, images may predicate future progression, as you can see here, and we are more focused on those uh, pre-cancer um, uh, images that also have follow-up or followed-up data that we can use to build the model for impending cancer. For example, we this is this is something. Uh, if you think about the pancreatic cyst, we have created a, a sense of uh, man-made epidemic in terms of detecting. And it's not because we look for pancreatic cancer; it is because we the use of abdominal scan. So abdominal CT images are pre-PDAC pancreas cyst precursors, early stage PDAC electronic uh, medical records, and also a radiologist report. And then data can be used to build AI-friendly data sets. And, uh, and in fact, um, I remember David uh, published a paper on this. Uh, oh, it is here, there. He, they published a paper uh, based on the same concept, and they also participated in APAC as well, and, and uh, David was funded for, for this. So we, to date, we have this pre-diagnostic cohort. We have about 1,400 cases of pre patient with pre-diagnostic CT scans, 3,000 controls, and also our early stage cohort, about 1,200 cases with uh, stage one, two, and pre and diagnostic CT scans, and 9,000 controls. And these are population at very high risk of delivering pre-cancer. Uh, his distributions are here, and again, I would like to invite you that if you'd like to join us uh, in this uh, pre-diagnostic -diagnost imaging uh, cohort uh, to build a predictive model for the future, uh, please uh, let me know. All these images are also being stored by our partner, JPL. How many of you have thought, thought about having JPL as one of the bio, in, in biomedical research. We reached out to them because our cost is much lower. They have this, um, the this system for uh, bringing uh, image data from across the globe. And this is kind of off the shelf. You can buy, you, know, you don't have to buy, you can use them. So JPL has helped us build uh, advanced knowledge system to capture, process, share, and support reproducible analysis of biomarker research. And also uh, they have leveraged informatics and data science technology from planetary and earth sciences. So again, it's a great partnership uh, with JPL in terms of building uh, biomarkers uh, for pancreatic cancer. Now, these are something we hear all the time about AI. Can AI improve sensitivity and specificity of image interpretation by radiologists? Yes, there are, there are situations where the image, the early stage images may not be really visible are interpretable, uh, and that's where the AI can really help us do this. So, so AI can also help building models for classification of oral stage cancer and pre-cancer, building models for patient stratification based on future cancer risk, 
and that could combine imaging features. Uh, and for example, you can use radiomic, traditional risk factors and blood biomarkers and help delineate the high risk group for screening and surveillance. And one of the paper that came out, Suresh Chairo, radiomics based machine learning models can detect pancreatic cancer or pre-diagnostic computed, which is CT scan at a substantial lead time before clinical diagnosis. Again, this is the use of artificial intelligence in terms of detecting pancreatic cancer early, early enough that could be then treatable or resectable. So, and this is the data they have machine learning uh, um, that um, Michael Gargans have been working on and basically showing that a radio scan or CT scan were not visible, but once they were used the machine learning language, they could detect those things. And in fact, they could find that the ML um, uh, classifier uh, uh, works better uh, than a radiologist reading. And it's not to say that uh, AI is going to replace radiologists, but simply saying that there are situations where ML or machine learning can help detect early stage disease. Another good example of um, uh, AI use, Michael Goggins from Johns Hopkins. So one example, uh, and that's something we, we always uh, deal about is that um, in case of pancreatic cyst, and especially the clinical management, the question comes, who should be discharged, monitored, or have surgery? And Michael Goggin used this so-called calm cyst or calm, that he can show it. So if you look into the top, and the bottom panel, the standard of care, a patient that should be discharged is about 13.2 versus patient that should not be, this should be discharged is, 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 is should be much higher. That tells us that by using the AI and machine learning, we should be able to triage and do better clinical management in terms of those who are likely to benefit from staying on and those who are not likely to benefit from staying on. In the second and middle column, you can say patient that should be monitored. And you can see the, the machine learning language is almost about, um, um, again, um, 48 uh, points are 49% versus 34%. Again, machine learning is doing much better than the traditional standard of care. And finally, patient that should have surgery, as you can see here, is, is again, is a very beneficial to have uh, this test sort of help from artificial intelligence and machine learning that could benefit uh, in terms of triaging between those which are, should be discharged, those which should be monitored, and those who should have surgery. Now, I just want to give you my gratitude. This, is, this, this really uh, has been a wonderful summer for me. Uh, my two wonderful daughters, uh, they graduate, uh, the one is is uh, uh, is Dr. Jigisa that um, he sees chief intern with me, uh, chief intern at Bake Forest, and uh, she got married as you can see on the very right hand panel, and my older daughter sees doctorate in public health and is she's also the pro temp mayor city of Columbia so I was elected this year, so that's that's really um, a, a, a something very gratifying that despite my busy schedules and being so deeply engaged in early detection research, they really persevere with me. This is a kind of dinner table talk all the time, biomarkers, biomarkers. They all know because they grew up with this kind of uh, semantics that biomarkers and early detection. So I really uh, take this opportunity to thank them for you know uh, tolerating me and bearing with me on this. The wonderful news is my grandson, you know, who just uh, three years, three months old, was, um, uh, was born in May 3rd. As you can see here, Bodhi, Bodhi means enlightenment. And basically he has enlightened our life. Finally, I have acknowledgement to say uh, that the person who I consider very visionary is late Charlie Smart. I don't know, how, have you, anyone in the audience have heard Charlie Smart? Have anyone has heard about the smart case, the girl kidnapped in Utah? And she was kidnapped by someone in Utah. I mean, yeah. okay. Charlie um, was at, at what he told me that at his time, he was the only among three oncologists. 
at that time. That was in 1989. Um, and uh, look at his vision. Um, he then thought about biomarkers, he said, and he recruited me to help build these biomarkers. So I'm so thankful to Charlie that he gave me that opportunity to build a very strong biomarkers team uh, at NCI and also across the country. For that matter, I don't believe there's any anything like uh, EDRN or any other program across the globe. Also on the right hand panel, this is a team that had uh, a team that has worked with me over the years. And many of my uh, wonderful program officers that helped me carry the responsibility of building this great consortia that we have in NCI. Now, people have been asking me, are you retiring? <laughs> well, I said, why is that? And their response is, well, because you keep getting awards after awards. He said, well, I hope this award is not associated with my retirement. <laughs> so, so this is the slide I always say, uh, uh, these are, I always say that, that the best is yet to come. It's not the retirement time. The, the research in pancreatic cancer they picked up. And if I can contribute something, this will be my cherished dream. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, due to the lack of time, stay on time, we won't if you have time for questions. We can catch Dr. Sabasaba in the uh, um, during lunch break, but, but we wanted to present him with the little, little award so we can remember this. Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 I think this is better. Yeah, dark. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The face is looked like a focus. So, just a disclaimer I'm not getting any monetary <laughs> reward here. I just want you to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we could start the next session, please, if the moderators could come up. Thank you. 